from uh, Ireland. We have uh, Grainne Kirwan. Thank you very much. Um, I especially would like to thank uh, Dr. Deb for inviting me all the way over here. It's always a pleasure to visit your country. It's my first chance to visit both Washington and Virginia, and I intend to make the most of my few days here. In terms of my name, please don't worry. I have been called everything. I have been called grain, grainy. Some things like that are just rude to talk about in public. I spent an entire conference once being called Granny. <laughs> so if you make any sound that sort of starts with the G or in my general direction, I'll normally answer, and please don't worry. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> so my area of specialization, uh, well, one of my areas of specialization is forensic psychology. I did a, two masters in forensic psychology, a uh, PhD in criminology, and my PhD is uh, started 2004, and that's when I started to be interested in the psychology of cybercrime. I started to look at the personality, the motivations of malicious computer hackers. And now I spend a lot of my time teaching on undergraduate psychology programs and a master's in cyber psychology program in the IEDT in Ireland. And I'm going to start this presentation by talking about dashing students' dreams. This is what I do to my poor final year undergraduate psychology students because they take a module on forensic psychology with me. And their assignment, as well as the exam, their assignment is to look at online representations of forensic psychologists and to identify how accurate they are. Which means that they look at all of those popular crime programs and they have to tear them to shreds. But look for the accuracies as well. So this is a, a bunch of some of this year's uh, assignments that we went through. And my students do tell me, yes, I do destroy some parts of forensic psychology for them because they realize it's not like the way that it's presented in a lot of these programs. But in a lot of ways, it's far more interesting and it's a lot more scientific. So. If you don't follow PhD comics or have never seen them, this is probably my favorite one, and I highly recommend it. As Dr. Croker just talked about, fear-mongering is very common. There are lots of those scary images of normally people in hoodies at laptops. And stories aren't necessarily a bad thing. They can be used to present information in a way that helps people to remember them. We know this from things like cognitive psychology. But those scary stories are all over the internet, not just about internet-related topics. Are fidget spinners a thing here? Yes. If you're wor worried, it's about choking hazards. So, But they grab our attention. They are effectively clickbait. My final year students gave me this award at the end of this academic year and then asked me how many of my stories were true. And I told them, oh, a good portion of them were true, but some of them are there to help them to remember the information because they stick in the mind. So stories are useful, stories have their place. But not all stories are accurate. Not all stories are true. And indeed, those robot overlords probably will keep away from your house but it's not necessarily because you put up wind chimes. So I'm interested in taking a field like cyber psychology and focusing on the data, not the lore. If you like this mug, come please talk to me later on, because <laughs> you and I are going to get along really well. <laughs> There are lots and lots of scaremongering stories all over the web about the bad things that technology do to people. This is just a sample of the ones that talk about video game violence leading to violence in children. And I'm sure you've all heard about these stories. One of these in particular is really interesting because it cites a report by the APA 
that talks about, that actually looked at video game violence, looked at how kids react to it and how they respond to it, and said, do you know, we actually cannot substantiate a link between these. We have no evidence that video game violence leads to real life violence. But that's pretty much exactly what their headline says. So they're citing the report, but presenting it in the most scaremongery way that they can. I've turned around to this one. This is one of my favorite quotes. If the children see these kinds of things over and over again, everywhere they see this, where women are beaten up, where people are shot and killed, and finally they become unconsciously delighted. It's terrifying. It was written by a psychiatrist in 1955. <laughs> because it wasn't about video game violence. It was about comic books. There are many, many pop culture panics. This is a great book I'm reading at the moment. So if you are interested in how popular culture all through history has been presented as the latest moral panic, do take a read of this book. It's great. This is slightly distorted by the recorder in the middle of it. But it says, everybody who went to the moon ate chicken. Good grief, chicken makes you go to the moon. One of our biggest problems when we're teaching psychology students things, oh, that's not good, is the fact that cause and effect is easily confused. Are we going to approve? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll be declining here, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the last four digits are. <laughs> so, within psychology, we have spent quite a lot of time telling our students don't believe these things. You know, take, question them, critically evaluate their accuracy. And just because we're now looking at cyber psychology instead of the more traditional branches of psychology does not mean that we get to throw this away. We focus on science. This is no longer working. <laughs> no, it's all gone terribly wrong. Can I have some technical help, please? <laughs> No? Oh, good. Better. Okay, so correlations. People love to cite correlations. Video games, more video games are bought, more crime happens, and so on. This website, Spurious Correlations, shows you correlations between all kinds of things. So this was the number of letters of the winning word of the National Spelling Bee by the number of people killed by venomous spiders. This one has worldwide non-commercial space launches with a number of sociology doctorates awarded in the US. Aliens. Hmm. US spending on science, space, and technology correlated with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Stop spending money on science, space, and technology. Please don't. Please spend lots of money on it. So. When people are looking at correlations and saying, well, this correlation is happening, we need to look more of a cause and effect. We need to focus on experimental research where we can. Sometimes, yes, we have to rely on a correlation because we can't manipulate the data. But a little bit later on, I'm going to tell you about some studies that do manipulate the data and some studies that do look at the real life and sometimes have to rely on correlations. But they shouldn't be our first protocol. This is a, a book written by one of my colleagues in Ireland. He's in Galway, it's called Brian Hughes, and it's Rethinking Psychology. Another excellent book if you want to look at how psychology focuses, or should focus more, on good science, not on pseudoscience. We've spent a lot of time trying to get psychology to the point where it is regarded more as a science. So, what do we know? This was the first book I ever owned relating to cyber psychology. It's Patricia Wallace's Psychology of the Internet. It was created, written in, or printed in 1999. And I really like this book. There's a second edition out, and there's several more. 
But that book was what inspired me in 2006 Christmas party to go up to my head of department and go, we should be teaching a Master's of Science in Cyber Psychology. I don't know anywhere else that does this. And by the fall of 2007, we had a Master of Science in Cyber Psychology in IADT in Ireland. A couple more joined us this year. There's one in the University of Wolverhampton. There's one in Nottingham Trent University. If you're looking to uh, get a career as a cyber psychology lecturer, Wolverhampton are hiring. They're a fantastic bunch of people. And there are many great books in this field. The one you can't see in the top left corner is by Thomas Parsons. The one second from the bottom, uh, second to the left from the bottom, is by Lee Hadlington, who's talking tomorrow. So we've got a lot of great scientific books and textbooks in this field now, including the second edition of that book by Wallace. And we also have quite a lot of books on cybercrime, sociology, psychology, technological aspects. Please forgive me for slotting a few of my own in there. And again, as Dr. Croker mentioned earlier on, we have journals. The one in the top left is New Media and Society. So this is not a shiny, shiny new field. It's a new field, but it's not shiny, shiny new. There are writings, empirical scientific writings, stretching back 20, 30 years. We are not making all this up from nothing. So what have we been researching? We've been looking at online versus offline behavior. Are there actually differences between the two? So, one of the most famous theories in cyber psychology is Solar's online disinhibition effect. And Solar, first of all in 2004, later in 2015, the white ones are the ones from 2015, suggested that there are various factors that lead us to be less inhibited in online contexts. It's very widely cited. Some of them we have evidence for, some of them we don't have evidence for. But, mandatory photograph of guy in hoodie. Some of them, like aspects of anonymity, we're already very familiar with. Psychologists have been studying anonymity in offline contexts for quite some time. So, is it different when it's online? Knowledge, okay. <laughs> What do we already know? What is that for our existing knowledge? So, again, psychologists have known for quite some time that if we're feeling we're being watched, if we're in the perceived social presence of another person, we change our behaviors. So, in an online context, we don't have that perception as strongly, and therefore it might lead us to less inhibited actions. So that in itself is not new. It's a new medium, new context, but as with many aspects of cybercrime, we can look at it as being the old wine in new bottles. It's a new context for this behavior, but the underlying behavior has existed and we've known about it for some time. How we behave in crowds. We know from social psychology that if we're in a crowd, we lose that sense of individual personality, we are more likely to engage in less inhibited actions. Online, we're in a big crowd, or at least we perceive it that way. So a large part of cyber psychology is identifying what do we already know? What can we take from existing offline psychology that has been tried and tested and see if it still happens online? Are we just coining new buzzwords for existing phenomena just because they're happening in an online context? And maybe 20 years ago, when the internet was new to most people, we could say, yes, this is a new thing. This is a new behavior. But now, when we do carry those computers in our pockets all the time, and it becomes just a part of our daily life, do we need a new buzzword? Do we need to put the term cyber in front of every other term we have already known in psychology. 
Or do we just say, yes, this is an aspect of psychology we are aware of, we've known about for some time, and we see it happening online too. Getting a bit more specific to cybercrime. I sometimes ask myself the question, are cyber criminals the best cyber psychologists? Do they actually know us better than we know ourselves? So, not too long ago, I got an email from Sage saying, please pay your bill. And I hovered over it for a moment. I'm making a confession in front of this group based on my topic of, ex of uh, expertise, saying, yes, I hovered over it for a minute. Because I very recently had been to the Sage Journal site and ordered a journal. So I very, very nearly fell for a phishing scam. I didn't, but I almost did. Do they know us better than we know ourselves? So, cyber criminals take advantage of all kinds of aspects of our decision making, of our behavior, and take advantage of those to carry out scams. So, that's the availability heuristic, Versky and Kahneman's. Confirmation bias. If you want me to talk about any of these in detail, please do come and chat to me, because uh, otherwise we will be here for the entire day and I can easily manipulate an entire conference for a day, so I won't do that. Framing, how we frame decisions. Uh, optimism bias, the fact that we think that good things are going to happen to us. Salience, how prominent things are. Hyperpersonal communication is probably one you might have come across as much, but it relates to how we can feel a stronger affiliation for somebody when we meet them in certain contexts, particularly media-enabled contexts. Peer behavior, social learning, what we think other people will do, and the flow state. Bear with me while I try this one. Cheek sent me high you. So coming from positive psychology, and we know that things like flow state, which is that sensation that you have when you are caught up in an activity you really enjoy, when time goes really fast, that's a flow state. And we know that this is something that's experienced by certain types of cyber criminals, particularly things like malicious hackers. So it's Kahneman's system one and system two decision making. And when we do look at whether somebody's likely to fall victim to an offense, to a scam, they're hoping that the victim is going to fall into that system one decision making, the ones at the bottom there, where we make a quick decision, where we rely on those memorable examples, those stories. We rely on heuristics. We rely on shortcuts to decide, yes, I'm going to click on this. Yes, I am going to send an email back to this advanced fee fraud because I am going to make millions. Okay. Quick decision making. Whereas actually, if we could persuade people to spend a lot more time making system two type decisions online, where they really think through the options, the possibilities, a more day-to-day -day example is if you're buying a breakfast cereal, you're probably using system one to choose which one that is. You're making a quick decision based on your normal buying tendencies. If you're buying a car, you're probably using system two. So if we can get people to use that system two, more complex cognitive processing, then we are more likely to prevent them from being victimized. But the offenders want us to use system one and will use techniques to try and get us to use system one. So there are many relevant theories from criminology, from psychology, that could be applied here. And I've mentioned a few of them already. So routine activity theory, some of you with a criminological background may have come across before. Routine activity theory says we need three things to co-occur at the same time and a crime will take place. We need a motivated offender, we need a suitable target, and we need there to be an absence of guardians. And if those three things happen together, a crime will occur. But it also means that all we have to do to prevent that crime happening is remove one, any one. Make the target less desirable, introduce a guardian, 
reduce or change the motivation of the offender. So when we're looking at trying to reduce cybercrime or tackle it as a problem or to deter individuals from becoming involved, we need to look at these three and see if we can remove one. There are many factors influencing offending. Apologies for the tiny print on this slide. But it's more there to indicate that actually, yeah, there are lots and lots of different factors that influence uh, offending. Many people ask me, why do hackers do what they do? Or what type of person is a hacker? And I go, well, that's kind of like saying, why do people study psychology? There are lots of different reasons. Or what kind of person is a psychology student? We are heterogeneous groups. We have many differences, and the offenders do too. Which is why it's dangerous for us to say, this is the profile. We have to look at all of the possibilities, all the differences. It's why we can't be that psychologist in that TV program and run in and go, well, I know exactly what they're like. Because it's far more complicated than that. Even something as specific as personality. We know from vast quantities of research in terrorism that it's used as a tool, it's not a syndrome. It's not a set of characteristics that make up a terrorist. Terrorism is more defined by the tool, the motivation, the end desired goal, and the means to get there, which we have seen in so many horrific examples, even in the last few weeks. So we're back to this. Just because somebody is spending time on some of the more dubious sites online does not necessarily mean they are going to become a cyber criminal. Just because somebody is engaging in some milder levels of online offending, let's say downloading torrents, does not necessarily mean that they are going to be the next cyber terrorist or the next malicious hacker. We need to identify those who really are most at risk from a wide variety of factors and try to divert them. Because there are different kinds of offending. In criminology, we look at the life course persistent offenders, those who start from early teens, even younger, and keep going through all their lives. And then we recognize the fact that juvenile offenders are far more common, those who start when they're young, but stop by the time they hit their late teens, early 20s. And a lot of those who might engage in more disruptive behaviors online probably fall into that category. The research does tend to suggest that. And we also have others, those late onset or occasional type offenders that we might see more likely to be in terms of fraud, identity theft, white collar crimes. But again, it's dangerous to think about offenders as in one type. And it's dangerous to think about cyber criminals as one type. There's arguments at the moment that those minor offenses, the downloading, downloading torrents will lead to uploading torrents. Uploading torrents will lead to hacking. Hacking will lead to malware development. Malware development will lead to terrorism. Take everything in context. Just because everybody who went to the moon ate chicken does not mean that that makes them go to the moon. So yes, some of those who are involved in the lesser offending will go on to more serious offending. But we need to be careful that those who are involved in the lesser offending are not unduly labeled and that they are not prevented from making the most out of their lives. Neutralizations, cognitive distortions, are a theory, a relatively old theory at this stage from the 50s, by Sykes and Matze. How people justify their offending. So the kind of excuses, so to speak, that they might have. A denial of responsibility, it's not really my fault. Or a denial of injury, they weren't really hurt. We can look at things like downloading, for example. The people who made the program weren't really hurt because I downloaded that torrent. Denial of the victim? Well, you know, it's really their own fault. 
condemnation of the condemners, they're bad people, therefore it's okay that I do something bad. Appeal to higher loyalties, like gangs, group membership, and so on. There are others, like everybody else is doing it, a later one by Coleman. So these kind of distortions and neutralizations are common. And a lot of what we try to do when we look at a, a criminal is say, what distortion are they using? What neutralization are they using? Why are they engaged in this behavior? And can we demonstrate to them that those cognitive distortions and neutralizations are not sufficient justification? Not specific to cybercrime, or even crime generally, but Eisen's theory of planned behavior is also very relevant here. So, this says that we have three aspects. Be perceived behavioral control. What can we do? Do we have, say, access to the torrenting sites? Do we have access to the malware? Plus, subjective norms. Are our peer group supportive of this kind of behavior? Do we think that it is normal amongst the rest of our peer group? Attitudes. What are our attitudes relating to these kind of behaviors, to the people, individual, the actors involved? And these three factors influence our intention to, to engage in a behavior. Not necessarily criminal, any kind of behavior. That goes on and changes the actual behavior itself. But it is really important to remember here that a slight change in any one of the original three factors is not necessarily going to change intention nor behavior. It diminishes the further on you go. You need to have a massive change in subjective norms or attitudes or perceived behavioral control. Which is why, for example, if you take down one torrenting site, it's probably not going to change the behaviors. They'll find alternatives. So here is where I start to introduce some of the more specific evidence that's been uh, presented in cyber psychology. This is a tiny, tiny fraction of the cyber psychology, cyber crime overlap. So this is one of the journals, as you can see, it recently uh, celebrated 20 years, cyber psychology, behavior, and social networking. I'm very honored to be on the editorial board of this one. And I am also extremely honored at the moment to be guest editor of a special issue on the psychology of cyber crime, which is going to be out later this year which means I know all the wonderful articles that are going to be in it. I just can't tell you about most of them right now. I know, I'm sorry, it sucks. <laughs> but what I will do is tell you about some other ones. So here is research by Fleming et al. that actually uses that theory of planned behavior and looks to see, does it actually have an impact on whether people are downloading or not? Why do people file share unlawfully? And yeah, I know the diagram is kind of scary now, it's got numbers on it and lines and all kinds of things. But for this one, we can look at it in terms of solid lines. Okay. And the solid lines here, this is particularly for music piracy. And the solid line says, yes, there's a relationship between that factor and that factor. The dotted lines say there isn't actually a relationship, at least not a significant relationship. So from this study, we can see that attitude has an effect on intention, which then has an effect on behavior. We can see that the subjective norms actually don't have a big effect. There's no statistically significant effect there. The behavioral control, in other words, the belief that they can actually do this, that they can achieve this, doesn't directly impact on intention, but it does impact on things like past experience. If they believe they can do it, it has an impact on whether they've done it before, and that impacts and whether they intend to do it again. So we can identify the best factors to focus on when we're trying to change these behaviors. This is research that I've been conducting and is in print um, with Chris Fullwood and Brendan Rooney in Wolverhampton and University College Dublin. And here we're looking at particularly the malicious clickbait that appears on social media sites identifying who's most likely to fall for it and who's not. So this part of our study describes data on a Malaysian sample of 300 undergraduate students. And we realized that a third have fallen for one of these kind of malware clickbait scams. 
And we know, because we looked at personality aspects, that most aspects of personality don't affect whether they will fall victim to this or not, except for a particular type of impulsivity called cognitive complexity. So if you can identify these things and say, okay, here is how to develop cognitive complexity, it might help to reduce it. Holt et al. have a really interesting research here which looks at the social networks of malware writers and hackers. And this is only a very tiny subset of the results. And I know it's another scary looking graph. But what it does is it tells us that those that are at the highest, uh, the highest uh, risk offenders are actually really centrally located within a network. And most of their research demonstrates the fact that particularly within the, the Russian sample that they looked at, we have people who are very strongly socially networked. It's not that guy in the hoodie at the laptop working on their own. So how can we try and counter the motivations? Well, there's again some theories we can rely on. So things like rational choice theory. Rational choice theory, in short, says we will engage in behaviors that are rewarded. We will avoid behaviors that are punished. So it does rely on the person's perception of whether they are going to be rewarded or if they are going to be punished. So if you can remove the perception that they are going to be rewarded for what they do, then that will help to reduce the actions. If they have a higher perception of punishment under three different aspects, certainty, they will definitely be punished. Severity, how severe that punishment will be. Celerity, not to be confused with salary. <laughs> Celerity is how soon after the behavior will the punishment happen. Turns out, certainty and celerity are far more important than severity. If they know that there's going to be a punishment and they know it's going to come soon, they are far more likely to learn from that and to avoid that behavior. Could we provide alternative tools to achieve the motivations? If we realize that a lot of this behavior is focused by motivations and is being used as a tool rather than as a personality type or an individual type, maybe we can change all that. I love Coder Dojo. I think it's one of the best things to have happened in the planet in a long time. If you are not familiar with it, it is where they take tiny, tiny children and they start to introduce them to coding. They come along to little schools. We run some in our own institution at home. Little tiny ones that learn the very basics of coding. They make friends who are interested in coding. And they learn it in a positive environment. So here we have individuals who are getting to experience coding, getting to enjoy coding, realizing that the thing that they're doing is a positive in society. Getting to interact with other people like them who are hopefully also going to get those positive values and hopefully going on to make the world a better place, get be more uh, employable, so many good things. On a more serious note, this is a paper by Quayle and Newman, uh, came out last year. It's another study in this field. This is where they did a content analysis of public reports about predatory behavior online with children. Um, you can get the gist of the conversation on the left where there is an offender who is demonstrating or offering to show a particular private part of his body to a child. The child says no and says, I am 10, I have a boyfriend, I do not want to see it. I really want to meet that 10-year-old child, particularly when they become an adult, and go, you're awesome. You know. So this study is important because it looks at real data between children online and predators. It looks at the actual conversations that happened. It's on a large sample set in Canada, self-reported um, by normally guardians. And we can see how frequent certain actions, certain requests are. The graph represents, I think it's about 166 conversations that they had a lot of data for, and they're the ones that they used for that graph. Of 155 of them, there were requests for sexual images. Whereas a contact request 
was 56. When I talk to parents at schools, that's often the contact request is the thing that terrifies them. Whereas I'm pointing out, actually, these are the things that are more likely to happen. Resilience is important. People like Sonia Livingstone have identified resilience as being a key element of protecting children online, particularly so that if something like the, le the conversation on the left happens to a child, they are able to go to a guardian, they are able to talk about it freely, they are not going to be given out to because they were on the internet talking to a stranger. There are appropriate skills that we can give to children. If you want some information about resilience and the importance of it in terms of online behaviour, that's a small sample of all the great studies that are out there. Another research study, I'm very near the end, don't worry. Another research study by Monica Whitty and Tom Buchanan looked at uh, the psychology of the online dating scams and the online romance scams. So why might somebody who was on an online dating site fall victim to somebody who's pretending to fall in love with them and then starts to ask for lots of money? How do we help those victims, particularly when they're often in denial because they're experiencing a double whammy of financial loss and of the loss of a relationship that they thought was serious? This study by Williams, Morgan and Joinson, Dr. Croker, you were talking about what factors influence somebody's likelihood to click on a, a particular scam. This is a study that looks at just that. It looks at how people make decisions when a pop-up appears on their screen saying, you must update this immediately. Some of the things that they identify is how important the task is that the individual is working on at the time that that pop-up appeared. If we're at a deadline, we're trying to work on a report, we're trying to finish it, chances are we'll just say yes. So again, how do we change that out of that system one quick decision to the real higher order thinking? Okay. Now, let's see if I can remember the start of this one. <laughs> so this relates to that theory of planned behavior. So it says again, that, as I mentioned earlier on, small changes in beliefs will tend to produce smaller changes in attitudes, subjective norms, and subjective control, even less change in intentions and less change in the actual behavior. Which means that if we want to change the behavior of the victims, if we want to change the behavior of the offenders, of the potential offenders, it's more important that we have as much one-on-one -on -one time changing those behaviors, changing those attitudes, rather than doing something where you're presenting it to them as a crowd or preaching from on high. I hope on that slightly positive note that I'll give you something to think about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Small bit of time, five minutes, for if there's any questions. Yes, sir. Indeed, that's a, that's a very good suggestion. Um, the fail-safe approach of going, okay, whatever the user does on their system, we have to make sure that they've actually thought it through, that they have perceived it. And that is one of the suggestions that comes up within the literature is, can we create a set of questions that before any major change to a computer system's operating system is made, for example, that they have to go through that check. And certainly that would absolutely help. Being able to make the person stop and think a bit more before they conduct an action would definitely be helpful. Absolutely.
<laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and it, it is horrifying sometimes. I've, I've come across a, a, a bank recently that said, no, you can't actually use special symbols in your password for your online banking system. I was horrified. Um, so yes, absolutely. The, the, the more we can make the safest option, the standard option, the better it will be overall. Sir? So the, the counter to that is people don't want to use the tool then. Yes, and of so course. Even with the other side of the psychology, right? Yes. Absolutely. And we can see this within, um, so things like UX, user experience design, is essential in how we demonstrate this. And we need to, to in involve those individuals who are experts within human community interaction, user experience design, in how we present these. Um, absolutely. Okay, so th that study wasn't specifically by me, it was by a, another researcher that I cited. Um, but that individual case, so in some cases, that particular case looked at what they planned to do. So there was actually a two-stage aspect. They initially asked about attitudes, what they thought people were going to do, and then they came back later. They started with 2,000 odd participants, um, and they came back and managed to get 1,500 of those to answer another question two months later about what they actually did. Um, and that was really a, an additional step that's missing from a lot of literature in terms of checking the data later on. Thank you so much. Sir. One thing that appeared in the Journal of the Ursula Commission was the cost to consumer to say Apple, for instance, once you start using 15, 16, or 20 character passwords. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and we are going to reach a resistance. There is a, a theory called protection motivation theory by Rogers, uh, and Rogers' theory looks at lots of these different elements. How easy it's to do, how, can I actually enforce it, is it going to slow down my computer, how expensive is it going to be, and all these elements. So even within a perceived behavioral uh, control change, we need to look at a lot of different sub-elements within it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, and, and then yourself, yes. Thank you. you. You know, you talked about all of the different ways that uh, our current generation is brought online and how they are basically making attempting to look exploitation. With the generation that is making laws and putting things into process right now, are there enough laws and rules out there protecting, you know, the current generation from the bad things that are going on on the web? Or is there a lack of understanding? Absolutely. So again, one of the things that it's kind of similar to what questions that parents ask me when I talk to them about safety for their children online, which is, what's the current app I need to be scared of right now? What's the current website I need to be scared of right now? Whereas what we really need to focus is on the online behaviors in a broader sense. So again, I've come across and I've tried to uh, advise uh, law reform commissions where they have talked about changes in behavior. And I've said, okay, well, look, this happens and it's a very ambiguous situation. We need to be careful about how you define whether this is criminal or this is not. And it's quite tough, particularly if people aren't in there and aren't using the system and have never used that system. So I think that there certainly needs to be a balance. Are there enough computer security experts? I think at this point in our, uh, our life cycle as a species, probably not. Um, but I do think that things like Coder Dojo are what are going to change that. Thank you very much for your question, sir. Yeah. 
Yes, I think, um, but what's also very interesting is that those, um, even in our own study where we're looking at those clickbait scenarios, um, were ones where those that were mo using the technology the most often were those who were most aware of the potential. That those who were most likely to be victimized were also those who didn't use it very frequently. So a familiarity with the systems is actually very, very important. And again, it's important for lawgivers, it's important for uh, 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 caregivers to understand the online media. Do we have time for one more question with this gentleman? Okay, last question. No, So they're growing up, and then there, the other piece is, is we're not used to an actual spatial orientation of a human being. For example, what I learned from training users was that giving them a password is horrible. But if I gave them a token, they would fight to the death to defend that little token. Everyone's password is one, two, three, four, five. But that token, they would protect. So, and you know, you can use spatial orientation on the screen where the alert comes up. But everybody hates user account control. This is the warning you were talking about. And I was, I was physically speaking across. So the kids are actually growing a lot faster. And the new systems are far more resilient. It's the old systems that we're trying to adapt. Us, all of us in this room, are the ones having problems. Indeed. I'd love to carry on this conversation a little bit later on. Hopefully we can. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Grania. We'd like to give you a certificate of appreciation you, for the uh, luggage to bulk up your uh, backpack <laughs> on the airplane. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.